G'day. At the end of October or early November, many Christians celebrate Reformation Sunday, a day for both joy and sadness. The Reformation established many blessings for the world, but it was a further division in Christianity, alongside the split between the Eastern Christians and the Western churches in the 5th century Council of Chalcedon, and uh, the, alongside the Catholic Orthodox split of 1054 AD. But we seldom address the complexities of the Reformation story, and I want to talk about an important one today. First, we're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 13, and then verse 27. It says, Now about gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray by mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it's the same God at work. Now, to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptised by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and were all given the one Spirit to drink. And going to verse 27, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. When you remember the Reformation, don't stop with Martin Luther. Certainly Luther's ringing cry, here I stand, I can do nothing else, is more exciting than Singley's eating sausages during Lent. But there's so much more. Singley's re reforms began about two years after Luther's. The ideas were similar, uh, but Luther was cranky and they couldn't work together. But reform had started and it couldn't be stopped. More and more reformers appeared. Martin Mutzer in Strasbourg tried to bring them together. The French reformer, a little later, John Calvin, wrote The Institutes of the Christian Religion, uh, still a bestseller for Calvinists. Even the Catholics tried. The Council of Trent started 28 years after Luther's theses and lasted eight years, but was too little, too late. But what of the Anabaptists and their Baptist cousins and even the Quakers? They are significant, but what do you know about them? Anabaptists and Baptists are more significant than their numbers suggest. We form a type of church which the theologian Donald F. Dornbauer uh, called the Believer's Church. And the church historian Martin Marty argues that all denominations have become much more like Baptists that is, more like the Believer's Church model. At university, when I studied 18th and 19th century England, we learned about John Wesley. Another lecturer said, you can't understand the 19th century of England apart from the Baptist preacher C.H. Spurgeon. Spurgeon was to the 19th century, he said, as Wesley was to the 18th. Spurgeon was so famous that Karl Marx's collaborator, Friedrich Engels, hated him. Spurgeon encouraged change through Parliament, and Engels wanted revolution. 
So what of the Anabaptists and their vision for the Believer's Church? In January 1525, several people, including Felix Muntz, argued publicly with Ulrich Zwingli because they believed that Zwingli was limiting the Reformation, which he himself had started. Muntz had earlier been among Zwingli's staunchest allies. The town council ordered everyone to cooperate with Zwingli and in particular to have their children baptised or be exiled. Three days later, on the 21st of January 1525, several families gathered at Mansa's home, among them Georg Blaurock and Konrad Griebel. They baptised each other and decided to disobey the council and not baptise their children. Immediately they began preaching and teaching across Switzerland and southern Germany, and they were called Anabaptists. Two years later, Muntz was executed for his faith, drowned after being caught preaching. Many others followed into the water. What did the Anabaptists want? What made them different? They were orthodox. They believed in God the Father, in Jesus, his only begotten Son, and in the Holy Spirit. They believed in salvation by faith alone, the kind of faith that leads to good works. They based their faith and practice on Scripture but they wouldn't baptise babies. They said only those who freely chose to follow Jesus should be baptised. Why impose a ceremony onto a child who can't understand? A baby won't even remember it. There are arguments for baptising babies, but Anabaptists and Baptists aren't convinced. Others say, what does it matter as long as they are baptised? Actually, it's about an entirely different view of society, one that our world still struggles with 500 years later. The Anabaptists, the Baptists, the Quakers were true radicals. For people back then, church and state were the same. A good citizen belonged to the state-approved religion, behave properly, keep the law, obey church rules, and you were in, you were acceptable. Governments and councils decided what you should believe. The Anabaptists disagreed. They claimed that the church is a group of believers within the wider society. Church and society overlap, but they aren't the same. For Anabaptists, faith is your choice, not the state's. Even today, many people believe that society should dictate your, your beliefs. You have your own private religion at home, but it's society which defines your work life, your economic role, your sexual morality, what you teach your children. Many people still think like they did in Zurich in 1521. And in fact, 200 years after the Reformation, power still was shared, often shared anyway, between church and state. They depended on each other. And Anabaptists said, we won't play that game anymore. By being baptised as believers, they said, we resign. They wouldn't join the army, take government jobs or stand for election. 80 years later, Baptists, Baptists said, we'll join the army if we have to, but we aren't the state's property. We, neither the king nor the bishops, can tell us or anyone what to believe, and we won't force our beliefs on anyone. Didn't Jesus say, pay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God? While the Lutherans, Calvinists and others worked with governments to decide what you should believe, the radicals, the believers' churches, planned a renewed society where thoughts and beliefs are free. The Anabaptists wrote it into their creeds. The Baptists printed it in their books. We wanted Protestants and Catholics, Jews, Muslims and unbelievers to be equally free to believe what they be believe and equally free to participate in society, to pull their weight, but also free to stand up and say in good conscience, I can't do that. Two Baptists, Thomas Helwes in 1612 and Roger Williams in 1644 wrote against coercion and persecution on account of faith. They said that 
state and church must talk, but neither owns the other. John Locke popularised what the Baptists wrote, and even the US and Australian constitutions were influenced by what these Baptists argued centuries ago. So what about our Bible passage? Paul describes a community of redeemed people, of saints. Most, redeem most reformers pictured a church where everyone in society be belongs, saved or not, believing or not. You're born into the country, so you are automatically signed up to the country's religion, regardless of your true beliefs. But the Bible's picture is of a community of people who've met Jesus, been baptised in the Holy Spirit and are learning to live as followers of the Lord. So Christians, whatever name we use, must function well in our own right. Believers are responsible to their Christian community. Whatever your spiritual gift, you must use it for the good of all. To each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good, as we read earlier. Sometimes it's very costly to stand for Christ and then we need each other. Don't kid yourself with dreams of being taken out of the world while everyone else faces tribulation. For 2,000 years, believers have undergone intense struggles without being taken out. What makes you so special? We're bound together in Christ into a mighty army equipped not with worldly weapons but with the sharp-edged sword of God's word and a faith, a shield and a helmet of salvation. Like those first Anabaptists, we're baptised in the Holy Spirit to form one body and we wear water baptism as our badge. Be clear, without faith, being dunked can't save you. Baptism isn't the point of the believer's church model. At the end of Mark's Gospel we read, whoever believes and is baptised will be saved, but remember that at the beginning of the same Gospel, John the Baptist says that the Christ is coming and he says, I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. So the end of Mark rounds off what was in chapter 1, that it is baptism with the Holy Spirit, which truly counts. Water baptism is an outward confession of the inward change. So when those first Anabaptists were baptised and swore to be faithful to the Lord who saved them and to the word of God, they showed each other by that act that they were in it together, in a renewed community of the saved, and that they were mutually united forever. Most were dead within 10 years, but the movement continued. And those first Baptists, beginning with a similar baptism in their refuge in the swampy coasts of the Netherlands, we're also coming together in the name of Christ to be a community of his followers, no matter what the world did. Some stayed in the Netherlands. Some returned to England to plant the first Baptist church. And they remained loyal despite persecution. Their pastor was imprisoned and died, but they still went on. They met under trees and in barns and were arrested. And still they continued. God raised up others, some congregational churches, some Methodists became Baptists too, and we still continued, united through faith in Jesus, who was given for us, and in the baptism of the Holy Spirit given to us as a guarantee of future blessings. When we trust in Jesus enough to begin following him, we receive the Holy Spirit. We're baptised in the Spirit, so we're soaked in him, and we drink of the Spirit, so the Holy Spirit enters into us and fills us. We can grieve the Spirit through sin and disobedience, or we can consciously return for the cleansing that Jesus gives through his shed blood, and we can be refilled with God's Spirit. If we give him his way, he will produce all those gifts that we read about, all the gifts that a church needs to make us a healthy, functioning body. As Paul writes, just as a body though one has many parts, but all its parts form one body. So it is with Christ, for we were all baptised by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. And now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. 
The world still needs radical Christians. It still needs a believer's church. It needs believers who don't have to accept what the state or society says. Christians bound to each other in Christ through his spirit and ready to do his will as true believers' churches. I want to encourage us to aim to be such people, regardless of what denominational name tag we have on ourselves. Amen. Thank you for watching.